Welcome to Green Building Matters, the original and most popular podcast focused on the green building movement. Your host is Charlie Cicchetti, one of the most credentialed experts in the green building industry and one of the few to be honored as a lead fellow. Each week, Charlie welcomes a green building professional from around the globe to share their war stories, career advice, and unique insight into how sustainability is shaping the built environment. So settle in, grab a fresh cup of coffee, and get ready to find out why green building Building Matters. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the next episode of the Green Building Matters podcast. I've got the easy job. Just once a week, I get to interview a green building professional somewhere in the world, compare notes, what's kind of exciting them. But, but even before that, you know, what's their origin story and you know, how'd they get to where they are in this, this movement, this green building movement? It's been good to me. And I can't wait for everybody listening to get to know Jeff Brockmore. He's coming to us from Philly, uh, one of the newly minted lead fellows here. Jeff, how are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks for having me, Charlie. Yeah, man. I know we connected Greenbuild and, and some other groups and just can't wait to learn a little more about how you got to where you are. So so take us back. You know, where'd you grow up and where'd you go to school? Great. Yeah. Uh, born and raised in Philly. Big sports fan. So please don't hold that against me. Uh, but a lot of pride there. Studied at Lehigh University. I uh, got degrees in civil engineering and architecture with a minor in urban studies, the late, great David Amidon, who sparked my devotion to Jane Jacobs and urbanism in general. Professor Amidon, along with uh, Professor Tony Viscardi, the architecture department were probably my two biggest influences from Lehigh. And I had a passion for all those things, but it was really drawn to the allure of high-rise construction management in New York City. So I joined Len Lee's Bovis at the time. Sure. 2006. So very fortunate to join when the market was red hot before the recession hit. Yeah, man. Well, first, I love New York. I know you're at Lindley's for, what, about 12 years there. Can't wait yeah. to unpack what kind of projects you're working on. But I want to thank you for not... Uh, you may know I'm based in Atlanta, so thanks for not rubbing in uh, these in there too much. So I, I saw what you did there. I appreciate that. So, yeah, all right. So buildings, though. Like, I mean, did you know you wanted to make a career in buildings? Did you get inspired in school? Or how'd you know, man? Yeah, I mean, I feel like it's very cliche to just say, you know, I love Legos as a kid, you know, but I mean, there's just something about seeing materials come together and really just being able to, you know, smell it even like, you know, the smell of concrete being poured, you know, the smell of, you know, stuff being cut or burned, you know, it sounds weird, but no, it was just kind of really fascinating. Similar kind of comparison of, uh, you know, the, the fountainhead, you know where there's like, you know, the two divergent paths and nothing against architects, you know, they're all, gr- all great people. I love working with architects. They're worth a ton of art, architects, but yeah. you know, something about getting your hands dirty, you know, really, and just you know, kind of seeing the physical, tangible, you know, uh, output is exciting. Love that, man. And uh, all right, so that's how you got into buildings and the built environment. But when did sustainability, maybe even lead first come on the scene for you? Yeah, so... The first project I worked on uh, actually was the first lead new construction project to be registered in the Upper East Side of Manhattan. Oh. It wasn't the first to be certified because it was a four-year-long project. So okay. <laughs> there's others that finished before. But at the time, the great Charlotte Matthews, who's now managing director at Rocky Mountain Institute, um, she was with Lindley's at the time running sustainability for, for the New York office. And I was fortunate for her to uh, be able to mentor me, not only in lead execution, but, you know, the greater industry opportunities and, you know, visiting waste sorting facilities and, and, you know, talking to, to vendors and the, the greater network of sustainability, both within the company and, and beyond. So I really uh, owe a lot to her to kind of, you know, getting me really started and, and, and kind of teaching me that you got your day job and maybe sustainability is a big part of your day job. Maybe not, but you can kind of get involved in all these things on the side. So that was, I would say, the, the first most impactful influence. Okay, man. Early lead project, high rise, Upper East Side. Love it. All right. So you've mentioned a couple mentors, uh, some incredible names there. Uh, anyone else that maybe opened a door or you looked up to? Anyone else you might give a shout out that kind of helped you along the way? Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, a person that I, I like to give a lot of credit to is a woman by the name of Amanda Kaminsky, who is now actually at Lendlease, you know, coincidentally. But I had collaborated with her when, when I was there. She was at the Durst organization at the time. 
And there was a, a group there that she ran called Building Product Ecosystem, which she eventually took outside of the organization as its own entity. And it was an industry collaborative focusing on advancing innovative solutions within the circular economy. Had <laughs> two big projects and were closed loop drywall recycling. And, and also the advancement of the use of ground glass pozzolan, like from uh, bottles from curb, curbside recycling that had no end use. So that similar to how Charlotte really broadened my, my network, I really owe a lot to Amanda in terms of just getting me connected and just having that collaborative mindset and focusing on like pilot projects, you know, start small and build from it. So I, I owe a lot to her as well. Yeah, these are great shout outs. I can tell you love buildings and construction and the, the materials, you know, and just getting out to the construction sites. I know some of your time, right? Probably in the field as a superintendent, as I get to know your resume there. So uh, tell us a little bit about some of those different titles you've held and, and then how'd you get towards director of sustainability? What, what was that path like? Sure. So yeah, I mean, I, I had the, the fortunate opportunity to, to have different roles within construction all kind of within the broader project management, but, you know, on the, on the field side, uh, you know, interacting, you know, with the trades face to face. Um, and then ultimately on the project management side, you know, more ov- overall managing budget and schedule and, you know, design coordination and things like that. And, you know, after seven or so years working full time on projects, I had the opportunity to move into a dedicated role. Uh, at Lend Lease because there was just a almost a unlimited amount of, uh, you know, questions and support needed for a handful of lead projects and other things. So able to, to justify a, a dedicated role there. And then I actually went back into call it, you know, straight construction when, um, moved back to Philly, which was precipitated by my, my wife getting pregnant with twins. After we already had one and the opportunity back in Philly with Structure Town, working in construction management, one of my drivers to joining that organization, in addition to uh, an old Lendley's colleague, uh, Joe Essick and close friend of mine, was another titan in the industry, Jen Toronto, who runs the sustainability program at Structure Town and a uh, fellow class of 2023 lead fellow as well. Jen joined the ranks as well. But that got me back to Philly. And after several years working there, there was an opportunity at at IPS, my current firm, Integrated Project Services, seeking a director of sustainability, which is the role I had held when I left Lendlease. So it's kind of a natural fit there. So I kind of bounced back and forth between the project side, the corporate side, project side, corporate side. Well, I know you had some MEP and commissioning experience, the field experience, man, well-rounded. Uh, well, so let's say someone's listening and, and they're in construction or they want to make a career in construction. Did you ask for the field time or you just tap for that? Uh, if you're given an option to be more project manager or superintendent, what would you tell someone coming up a construction company ranks now? I would say that between field time, project management time, and even if there's an opportunity to focus on, you know, like estimating or, or scheduling, the more of that rounded experience you have, the better you will be at all of those other things. Whether you decide, hey, you know what? I, you know, like being in, in the field and I want to stay in the field. Well, having project management or scheduling, estimating experience will make you a better super or vice versa. So, you know, that certainly helped me have a well rounded experience. And now I don't even work in construction. Full time. I mean, I'm in a corporate role, but you know, we do a lot of design as well. And even though I studied design, I was never working in design, but now I'm working more in design. And it's my experience in construction that I think gives me insights in design. And the, and the same would go vice versa as well. So it's all within the built environment and it's all interconnected. And the more holistic views you have, the, the better you will be. Man, thank you for that that wisdom there and coming up through the construction ranks. That uh, a little, I, I agree with that. I I started in commercial construction when I got out of Georgia Tech and started estimating, and then got tapped more on the project management side. But I always loved getting out there with the superintendents, and so I you you had a lot more field experience than I did. If I had to do it all over again, I think I'd follow your path. 
All right, so one more look back. What are some of your proudest achievements? Well, to be honest, a lot of the things that I I really look back to are kind of outside of what my day job was. You know, there's a lot of exciting projects I worked on in my day job, but at the end of the day, you say, well, well, that's your job, right? So like, yeah, it's an achievement, but it's kind of the things beyond that I look back on. You know, when when I was still living in in New York, I, I was fortunate to be friends with one of the most interesting people I know, a guy named Gil Lopez, who was a gorilla gardener and helped found Smiling Hogshead Ranch, which was what you call interstitial space, you know, the in-between space of old infrastructure. And uh, Long Island City, Queens is actually an old rail spur. And I kind of partnered and joined that group with him in about 2012 and helped grow Smiling Smiling Hogshead Ranch you know, to a more established and permanent organization. We were eventually found out by the MTA who owned the land there. And a bunch of surveyors saw us and we were forced to become a legal entity so that we could get insurance and satisfy their garden license agreement and had to create a 501c3 and kind of go through all that. So there was a small group of us that were you know, just kind of learning on the fly. And this whole time, we're like, this house of cards could follow over at any time. I mean, there's no way that they're going to let us do this. But we we pulled through and they're still going strong. Uh, just so, you know, have 12 years at this point. And um, it's a very special place. And for those of you in, you know, Queens, you know, it's walking distance from the Hunters Point Seven train stop. And it's kind of all hidden gem in, in the city. So that's kind of one of the things I look back on. Dude, I love that story. Oh, man, thanks for sharing. And uh, right where that is, Long Island City, right there. All right, so how about present day? Tell us more about your company and tell us what's a day in the life of Jeff these days. Yeah, so present day, uh, lots going on. You know, my kids are now, you know, nine and nine and twins are almost seven, you know, so keep them busy with them as well, you know, on top of work stuff, you know, very involved in the local public school that our kids go to, the Cook with the Hickens School, that's Philadelphia Public School. And as most people know, you know, the public school system sometimes is has challenges that there, there's opportunities to to help there with the local schools. And I've gotten involved in the Wissa Hickens Sustainability Council and I'm the president of that now, which is uh, a 501c3 that really focuses on campus screening efforts and environmental education and spending grant money that goes towards that, including projects that kicked off right after COVID. Really, it was 3,500 square foot of deep paving of the uh, existing blacktop and replacing that with trees and other native vegetation. So that project uh, occurred. We, we made a little bioswale to help divert, uh, you know, rainwater and knock down ponding in certain areas, um, benches, tables, different things like that. So that's been kind of really fun on the side as well. Also involved in a local church, which is the same church I grew up in. A lot going on there. And yeah, I mean, there's just, there's most of it is, is pretty local. I mean, it's again, there's that kind of inside of work and outside of work. Inside of work, uh, you know, projects are all over, all over the US, all over the, the globe, but outside of work, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's, you know, close to home that kind of really uh, energizes me as well. Yeah. I love all of that, man. And way to get involved with your kids' school there and, and make that change. I, I love that. Uh, tell us more about uh, Philly and green buildings in, in Philly. Are there some good local mandates? I know you've got some benchmarking mandates on the existing building energy efficiency side. You know, how's it look for new construction? Is it hard or easy to do a lead project there in your town? How's it going? Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I would say that there's a lot of, you know, following suit from, you know, what, you know, New York has done and kind of like modeling over some of those benchmarking laws. And so it's good to see that wave occurring in, in a lot of different cities. You know, Philly has its own, you know, unique challenges with, you know, different city agencies and how the government works. And, you know, in a lot of ways, uh, different from New York, where the majority of my, you know, construction experience was. So I got to see a taste of that when I was, you know, my my first big project down there was uh, working at the Wells Fargo Center where the uh, Flyers and Sixers play, managing the renovations there for two years. And 
Yeah, there's, so there's a lot of scrutiny on a big public project like that, and a lot of scrutiny by L and I, which is the local, you know, you know, building department. So you know, got to kind of get in the weeds with different approvals and stuff like that. I would say, you know, from a from the lead perspective, you know, there's, you know, uh, I did work on a lead project for Spark Therapeutics when I was there, which is in that um, school from yards. And uh, I wouldn't say there's anything that's necessarily different or, you know, any additional challenges. It's, you know, at the end of the day, there's, you know, we're trying to go above and beyond code, right? We're trying to go above and beyond the minimum mandates. So a lot of times we're kind of looking past that. But uh yeah, I guess because a lot of my projects now are outside of Philly proper, I'm not getting as much of that kind of Philly specific attention that I did when I was working on projects there. Yeah, no, thanks for sharing. I uh, was just kind of curious. Um, let's talk a little bit about like credentials. I know you've also got your well AP, but you've had different lead credentials. I mean, you know, how have credentials helped you? Also, maybe some volunteering. I'm not sure if you're doing anything with some of the USGBC chapters, but, you know, how has that helped you? Yeah, so I got my first lead AP credential in 2007. And from there, I, uh, I I also picked up ID and C and ND later on, and then well. So you know that's I think it's good to kind of you know use use those credentials to kind of help set goals and kind of force you to study things because as anyone who went to school knows, every year after you graduate school, you're less and less likely to want to study something or memorize things. So to pursue those certifications kind of forces you to do that in a way. I did go back to uh, to grad school and got my master's in environmental management from uh, Pratt Institute. So that that was helpful as well to try to keep myself sharp. But yeah, I think it's just good to, you know, keep yourself sharp. And, um, you know, obviously it's nice for, um, you know, for credentialing. Yeah, no, thanks. Uh, how about projects? It's hard to pick a favorite project, but in general, Jeff, what kind of buildings or projects do you like working on? So I got to say that, you know, I mentioned the uh, project for Spark Therapeutics and the Bulletin building right by 30th Street Station. That was the first time I worked in, in a historic building and kind of, you know, you kind of get the, the, the history, all the baggage <laughs> of the building history along with it. It makes it very frustrating, but it's also um, very fascinating, very interesting in, in seeing historic buildings being transformed into new, to new things. Some of the projects I'm working on now, some of which are uh, still somewhat conf- confidential, but, you know, working on projects in the life science sector now, you know, pharmaceutical manufacturing facilities that are traditionally huge energy and, and water hogs. I mean, it's, it's crazy how much goes into you know, producing, you know, life-saving drugs and other things. And so, but with that comes huge opportunities to um, make big impact on, you know, energy savings and and water savings and innovative ways to recycle um, wastewater. You know, these clients are serious about it. I mean, I'm working mainly for publicly traded, you know, big names in the pharmaceutical sector that have made extremely aggressive commitments to be, you know, net zero by, you know, 2045, 2050 with SBTI aligns targets for reductions by 2030. And the only way you do that is with major changes to the approach. And so it's really forcing us to, to push the needle with, you know, technologies and, you know, different elements that quite frankly, are that it takes coordination and it takes, you know, scheduling and budget alignment I and mean, all the real things that projects need to look at. So it's, uh, it's a lot. And I'm very hopeful that in a matter of a couple of months, the, the first big one is going to, you know, hopefully get its uh, certification, knock on wood. And we've got a handful of others in the mix as well. Coming soon. I love that. All right. So I'd love to ask a green building professional like you about the future. You know, what's what's kind of exciting? What's coming at us in this green building movement? Well, I mean, I, I think one of the biggest and most important changes is heat pump technology allowing us to get higher coefficients of performance at lower temperatures and to be able to start to make steam 
that this can be done at a, at a smaller scale. And I think just over the summer there in the New York Times, there was uh, some startup, you know, with heat, heat pump making steam. And uh, in my sector, there's great steam demands. So we look at, okay, how do we eliminate the demand for that steam to begin with? But with what we need to generate, how can we do that with something other than fossil fuels? So that's kind of the cutting edge of what I see on, on the design side, because we know that the electrical infrastructure is going to be a limiting force for, you know, having, you know, electric steam boilers and whatnot. So we are doing those as well. But, you know, that heat, pe- heat pump technology is, I think, ultimately a big thing. Battery storage technology constantly improving. That's going to be huge. We're going to be relying on it. It's actually kind of scary to think of, you know, when companies, and especially construction companies, make goals to be, you know, net zero or reduction by a certain year. It's so much dependent on the available technology. Not only that technology existing to begin with, but to keep up with it. So like if you call up, you know, a big Redful company and say, yeah, I want, you know, I heard Volvo makes these electric excavators. Can I get one? Or, or, or uh, you know, they're like, yeah, get on the waiting list. You know, I mean, electric pickups, talking to Colleagues at other companies are like, yeah, can you get electric pickups? No, there's a you know long line there. So um, that stuff being readily available is going to be huge for our success. And I know the heat pumps, a lot of money from the Inflation Reduction Act. That's going to really help accelerate that. But a lot of what you've told me, it reminds me of smart buildings and smart grid, but I haven't heard that phrase in a while. I don't know. I think the pandemic hit and people set that phraseology aside and maybe we're dusting it back off there uh, had another lead fellow on the podcast recently talking about how when you go electric, all electric, right? You might have to increase your service size, right? From the utility company. And so just interesting uh, what we're all going through there. So anything else to add about kind of what you're excited about, what's coming up, anywhere you kind of read up on this content? Yeah, I mean, you know, you talked about smart buildings. Right now, one of the newest buzzwords is uh, digital twin. That uh, was mine. And, and just like a lot of things... You know, people don't always know exactly what that is or what it means or what it means for their building. That's also kind of the next frontier is, and especially in, in my sector. I mean, these are incredibly complex buildings with tons of, of data and information flowing around for different purposes, but how to harness that all into some sort of visualized system that, you know, can represent the building. And then ultimately incorporate things like machine learning and AI. I mean, we know that, you know, you know, part of the transformation of, of society in general, buildings are no different. And it's also bringing forth uh, a big missing piece, which has been, you know, the availability to measure things. We all know the old adage, like, you know, you, you can't improve what you can't measure. You know, we get a lot of clients that want us to compare one building to another building and it's, you know, sometimes I, I say it's not apples and oranges, it's apples and elephants, right? So you got to get more granular in your data to be able to make better comparisons, to be able to actually even prove, you know, the things you're doing are actually better. And um, so so I'm, I'm really excited about that and uh, just how we can, you know, bring back smart buildings, right? Like bring that buzzword back. Yeah. We want our buildings to be so. Let's bring it back. Also with the wellness movement, you know, we're way post pandemic now. Let's bring back that proactive wellness real estate, those green walls, that biophilia, the, the better lighting controls, not just pandemic response. So let's bring back smart buildings, uh, apples and elephants, as Jeff's taught us here. So let's do some rapid fire questions here. Uh, Jeff, get to know you more. Uh, what would you say is your specialty or gift? I would say being scrappy. And resilience, kind of persistence, trying multiple angles. The guy that hired me um, forced me to read this book, Who Moved My Cheese? Yeah, oh, sure. it's, uh, I love it. Yeah, I mean, short book. I mean, everyone should read it. And it's just, you know, something that, that we take for granted after, you know, being in the industry a while, you realize you have to be resilient. But especially in, in sustainability, you know, just you ask people to do things, they say, no, you got to push back and you got to be like, yeah. we have to do this. And sometimes you got to win them over first. So that's, uh, that's okay. like, that is, a, that is a specialty and gift for some reason. Maybe it's because you're in Philly. I'm just picturing a boxer, Rocky, run the stairs, something like that, man. Scrappy and resilient. So I love it. Yeah, exactly. 
Oh, that's a great book. We'll put a link to that book for sure. So how about uh, any good habits, any good routines keep you on point? Yeah, well, you know, I started about two or three years ago. And actually, my, my wife and I went on a yoga retreat for her for her birthday to this kind of secluded place in, in West Virginia. And I'm not a big yoga person. She goes fairly often. But I kind of picked up from that this morning routine where I I, I kind of do like cobra pose on the uh, living room rug and you know, it, like in the dark in the morning with my coffee there and kind of you know, like do some like, you know, cat cow stuff, just like slow stuff. It's not like, you know, intense. And, you know, sometimes I kind of doing it while I'm kind of, you know, reading and and just kind of get my mind set for the day. And I kind of have to do that every day. Mm. And sometimes I'm like, maybe I wake up late. I'm like, oh, I don't have time or like I feel anxiety about something and I just jump right to the computer and I don't do that. It, it'll come back and, and hit me by the end of the day. Like I have to do that. And, and I have like lower back stuff that I'm, you know, kind of working through. So it's all kind of part of that. But really yeah. just to get mentally prepared is, is, uh, is big. Hey, that's great self-awareness. You know that you got to do a little bit of it there. It sounds like you're doing a lot more yoga than most, man. So I love that. And maybe that trip had some good influence on you. So how about uh, bucket list? As you get to know me more, I'm a fan of a bucket list. Not everybody has one, but if you had a bucket list, what are one or two things on your bucket list? Maybe some adventure, some travel. Maybe you want to write a book. I don't know. What's on the bucket list? Yeah, I mean, you know, travel is one and, you know, anyone who's got kids knows this. And if you're thinking that you want to have kids, you know, just travel as much as you can. So that's one thing that, you know, my, my wife and I, I'm ashamed to say we celebrated our 10 year anniversary in March and we're like, let's go on a trip. And we're, we're still trying to figure out when we can schedule that. But that, you know, there's so many places that I want to visit and see. And ultimately bring the kids. And again, you know, it's expensive to travel with kids, right. you know, but to be able to give them the opportunity to, you know, kind of see different cultures and whatnot is something that we hope to be able to, to prioritize. But, you know, in terms of places to go, you know, I've never been to, you know, like Northern Europe, Scandinavia, you know, there's South America, parts of South America that I would love to go to. Uh, one of my old colleagues, Lucas Claria, he's, he lives in Argentina in Buenos Aires. That's a far plane ride. And I know, uh, you know, but you know, there's, there's all sorts of places I'd, I'd like to go, but, uh, yeah. Map it out. I love it. Thanks for sharing. Uh, actually my wife and I, our anniversary is in March too. We're 17 years in there, but, uh, uh, you're right, man. We have three boys. So I got five seats across the Delta plane when we travel. That adds up fast. So, uh, all right. How about books? Uh, you've mentioned uh, one or two. I'll put links there. Uh, you know, who moved my cheese? But anything else you'd recommend to our listeners? A book doesn't have to be about buildings or an app or a podcast. Just, you know, kind of a pro tip here for our listeners. Yeah. Well, you know, one I feel like I reference a lot, Natural Capitalism, right? And I think it's, it's an important book because as anyone knows, anyone in sustainability knows, there's this kind of like stigma sometimes that it's like anti-capitalist. And it's absolutely not true. And when you look at, you know, how we define value and create value propositions, I always tell people that, you know, I am a staunch capitalist, but only if you are including all the value in the equation. Because when you internalize, you know, values of, you know, what what the, you know, the value of, of carbon is or avoided carbon, or the value of water, the value of health and well-being, which is very hard to assign a, a dollar value to, but that value is still there. And if you bring that in the equation, internalize all the externalities, now capitalism is, you know, something that is holistic. And it's not something that it's, you know, just going to focus on, you know, the dollar value of things. So that, that was, was an important book. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I just, I read a lot of articles. I know that's kind of, you know, nowadays it's like more people are, are just reading articles and not reading as many books as they should, but, you know, trying to, uh, get a breadth of sources oh. for news and things like that as well. Yeah. No, I, shoot, I read a lot of articles too, trying to listen to some podcasts or even a 
YouTube video I feel like is somewhat of a trusted source or a source, or at least it encourages me a little bit. You know, hey, I think the world's changed a good bit there. Uh, so, all right, the last couple of things as you kind of look back on your career, anything you wish you'd have known earlier, any career advice maybe you wish you'd have learned earlier? Man, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm going to think about that just for a second. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess, I guess the, the idea of, you know, the expectation that you're going to have to be persistent if you want certain things to happen. I remember in my younger, more naive times, just kind of more frustrated that, you know, people weren't uh, listening or, or progress wasn't happening. And with, you know, pretty much any sort of initiative you're trying to roll out, it takes time. You got to chip away at it and you got to focus on where can I get a quick win? We're kind of rather than trying to bite off everything. It's like that pilot project mentality, which, you know, again, Charlotte taught me early on in my career. I'm very, I'm very blessed to have that, but don't try to do everything. Like just make a, a, a small example of a success so that you can then point to that and say, well, I want to double that rather than saying, you know, this has never been done before and I want to do something big. So it's, it's that kind of, it's like a quant. Like quantum physics is based on that, you know, notion of just kind of like incremental steps, you know? And I love that. Where can I get that quick win? You know, that leads to momentum and uh, that's really good stuff. Dude. Thank you. Uh, all right. Well, as we start to come to a close here, let's say someone's listening, Jeff, and they're getting real fired up about your story. And uh, they're just now jumping in to the green building movement. Any words of encouragement for them? I would just say there's there's a lot of good resources out there. And, you know, most people in the green building world just want to share their knowledge. And there's this kind of linkage we have because we're all working towards the same end goal. And, you know, competition doesn't always cloud that like it does in other settings. So if you seek advice, if, I mean, very few times if I just even you know, cold ping someone and say, Hey, you know, so-and-so gave me your name. Would you be willing to share, you know, you know, strategies or compare notes, you know, even if they're working for, you know, competition, you know, I just find that you know, the green building sector, people just want to share because if we can help each other out, we can justify to our bosses that, Hey, we should be doing this stuff because they're doing it. And so it's important to take advantage of that. So, you know, be proactive, reach out to people, ask for help and offer what you can so you can contribute as well. A lot of wisdom there. Uh, well, I'm in the Atlanta area, just in Philly. If anyone listening, you know, wants to reach out, ping us on LinkedIn. Actually, why don't you reach out to Jeff? Let him know what you thought of this interview. Jeff, I'm pretty fired up. I know we're getting to know each other more. And just thanks for sharing your story today on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it was, it was great uh, meeting you at Greenbelt. And I just want to say I'm looking forward to seeing you in, in my home turf. Yeah, man. It'll be my eighth consecutive Greenbelt. Oh, man, that's a lot. All right, you got me way beat there. So uh, I'll be there. We'll have a good time, man. Uh, thanks so much for being on the podcast today. I, I loved it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Green Building Matters podcast. At GBES.com, our mission is to advance the green building movement through best-in-class education and encouragement. Remember, you can go to GBES.com slash podcast for any notes and links that we mentioned in today's episode. And you can actually see the other episodes that have already been recorded with our amazing guests. Please tell your friends about this podcast. Tell your colleagues. And if you really enjoyed it, leave a positive review on iTunes. Thank you so much, and we'll see you on next week's episode.